Welcome everyone. We are very honored today to have Dr. Jean-Baptiste Fini presenting for us. He is a senior scientific researcher at the French National Research Center in the Living Organism Adaptation Department at the National Museum of Natural History. In today's webinar, Dr. Feeney will take us through the important role that thyroid hormone plays during development. He will explain how his team uses animal models to understand how chemicals that many pregnant women are exposed to can disrupt thyroid hormone signaling and ultimately neurodevelopment. One of the things that I find most exciting about Dr. Feeney's work is that he has studied environmentally relevant chemical mixtures and work to anchor his research in Xenopus to epidemiological studies. So thank you, Dr. Feeney, for presenting for us today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Yeah, uh, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I hope that everybody um, hear me correctly. So um, uh, yeah, this is really an honor to me, uh, for me too, to uh, make this webinar about uh, how we decipher thyroid hormone disruption during development. So the first thing I want to stress is that the thyroid hormones are essential in all, all vertebrates. And you have the structure uh, of the three iodothyronine, and this is the exact same uh, hormone that is found across vertebrates, but also chordates. And these hormones are um, uh, making some crucial uh, transition in all vertebrates. For example, you have the amphibian metamorphosis, bird eight etching, or mammals' brain maturation. And this is the most uh, complex halogenated molecule synthesized by vertebrates, and it's the only one that contains iodine. And you will see that both iodine, iodine and thyroid hormone are essential for brain development. So when you look to the thyroid hormone axis, it's a complex as all the other uh, uh, endocrine axis, but you have in the middle, so the, the thyroid gland, I don't know if you, you see the, the mouse, but uh, the, the thyroid gland synthesized the T4 and T3, four because uh, there, are, there are four uh, iodine atoms and three because of three iodine atoms. And the iodine can enter the thyroid gland thanks to the sodium iodine symporter. And the T4 and T3 found in the blood exert a negative feedback on both hypothalamus and pituitary and uh, are taken in the bloodstream um, uh, uh, they are distributed to the whole organism thanks to serum binding globulin, uh, uh, proteins like thyroxine binding globulin, transthyretin, and albumin. And they finally can reach organs like brain and they enter the cells not via passive diffusion as it was thought uh, before, but uh, since two uh, two uh, 2004, we know that there are um, membrane transporters that ex ex uh, are expressed and they are specific to thyroid hormones. For example, MCT8 and OATP. And thyroid hormones encompasses a lot of multiple processes uh, during brain maturation. And it, that uh, means gene transcription, neurogenesis, migration, synaptogenesis, and myelination. And you can think that if one of these um, uh, process are disrupted by an, a chemical that could have functional impact like uh, learning deficits, hearing loss, or visual defects. I will give you two examples. One is a uh, culture cell done with purkinia cells that are found in cerebellum. On the left part of the slide, you can see uh, uh, purkinia cells on which a T4 has been put. So you can see a, a nice uh, arborization and a, a, a final um, differentiation. And on the right, when you preclude thyroid hormone to enter and to be in the vicinity of the cell, uh, you have no uh, differentiation, at least no proper differentiation that occurs. And uh, you can see also that thyroid hormone has a role on neural, uh, neuronal stem cells. Uh, a work from the, the, from the lab of a person in the lab, uh, they showed that progenitor cells that are found in specific area in the brain uh, have a, a fate that is dependent on thyroid hormone. For example, if you put thyroid hormone on a neural stem cell, they will be pushed into differentiation into neuronal pathway. Uh, conversely, if you prevent thyroid hormone to be in the vicinity of these progenitor cells, you will um, uh, make them more uh, to, to be um, in the oligodendrocytes and on the glial cell fate. 
So these illustrates that the, there is a tight control of thyroid hormone levels for the cells, but what does it mean for an organism? And we have, uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, example of the Alan Erdon Dudley syndrome that was characterized and uh, in, in 1944, but the, the, the causes, uh, in, uh, the mutation of a single um, transporter, membrane transporter, and CT8 was uh, discovered only 15 years ago. So you have these um, T4 and T2 that cannot enter the cells, and uh, the, the, the children suffer from both uh, severe IQ deficiency and also a muscle apotonia. So here you illustrate that with one transporter, you may have a really strong um, a phenotype of bo on both brain and body. But most importantly, we know that MCT8 is also expressed during uh, gestation, during um, the, on the placenta level, you can see that there is a dynamic expression, uh, expression of MCT8. That means that the maternal thyroid hormone are also important during development. And this illustrates the tight control and we need a tight control of maternal hormone. So uh, we know that all babies in Western countries are tested at birth for the thyroid stimulating hormone. So the, the one that is produced by the pituitary. And we know that uh, if there is uh, two high levels of this TSH, um, the, the, the babies are hypo. Uh, con congenital uh, suffering from uh, congenital hypothyroidism. The problem is that if you see these slides on the crucial role uh, of thyroid hormone, so the first line, it's okay, normal brain development, you have normal maternal and fetal. For the two uh, that follow, uh, there is uh, the, the test that is done at birth. Uh, you will see that there is a missing thyroid hormone, that there is a hypothyroidism. But from the last one, when only during the first weeks of development you miss or you have disturbed maternal thyroid hormones where the baby only relies on maternal levels, we don't know the consequences. So we can ask what developmental processes could be affected during this first trimester. So I, I will show you that you have the brain development that is starting really, really early. Uh, you have two weeks in non words for the cerebellum, and you have a really uh, tight and organized, orchestrated um, modification and structure of the brain. And you can see that these synaptogenesis, myelogenesis, really start early on. So the, when you have this time first page of how the first nine months shapes the rest of your life, we may ask that perhaps it's more the first three months of your life. And I want to remind uh, a, a, a recent study from uh, Robin Peters and, and Tim Corrivar, where they show an association of maternal thyroid function during early pregnancy and IQ in offspring and brain morphology. So it's done on the Rotterdam cohort, and they followed the children um, at six, eight years old. On this graph, on the left part, you can see that when the mother has between 12 and 20 picomola concentration of thyroxine, so the T4. Um, the, the children that uh, six, eight years old are really more prone to have an IQ and the, the chance of having an IQ over 100 is really higher than if the mother has below 12 or over 20 picomolar. And in contrast, when you see the percentage of children with an IQ below 85, you decrease the risk of uh, having a low IQ when the mother has between 12 and 20 picomola. So this illustrates that uh, yeah, too much is as bad as too little. And importantly, they did also a RMI on the brain of the hypo and hyper uh, uh, thyroid, thyroid uh, children, and they saw that the structure was also affected. Uh, with a reduced cortical volume and a low white matter density. So when you think about the central concept of developmental origin of adult health and disease, where you know that gestation and childhood is a really, really critical window of exposure to the endocrine disrupting compound with possibly some late effects, this uh, is uh, often used for the steroids, but it also includes the thyroid hormone availability. And 
Uh, so the question is, is there a direct effect and uh, the babies are, or the fetuses are exposed to the, the chemicals? And the answer is yes. Uh, we know that the many chemicals are crossing placenta barrier. And so we are developing in a soup of chemicals. And for example, you have these, uh, the phenols like bisphenol A, benzophenone, which is a UV filter, or a, a, a legacy pesticide like the metabolite of DDT. You have uh, some phthalates, PCBs. So we wonder, okay, we know that, how to test thyroid hormone disrupting potency. So the first strategy we used was to start from exposure data found in literature. So we started from a Tracy Woodruff study in 2011, where she showed that all women, all pregnant women in Hen Hanks uh, were uh, exhibiting like an average of 33 compounds out of 52 analyzed and 15 were ubiquitous. Among them, you can see that you have poly uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, metals, organochlorine pesticide phthalates, or brominated flame retardants. Our work was to uh, look into uh, literature to find the concentrations that were found in amniotic fluid of all of these 15 compounds. We did find the concentration and we recreated a mixture of these compounds. So phthalates, pesticides, allogenated compounds and perforinated. So the perforinated compounds are uh, the anti-adhesive uh, compounds that are found in fried pan, but also in, uh, in the cloth. And we wonder, okay, what's the model to use and to test this representative amniotic mixture? And we used the property of this uh, conserve of thyroid hormone over the, the evolution, because as I told you before, a T3 peak is necessary to make the brain maturate in human, but it's also necessary uh, for a tadpole to metamorphose into a frog. And if you block this peak, the tadpole ne never, never became a frog. So we used this property and we tested the representative amniotic mixture on tadpoles, on a wild type, but also transgenic. And we used an essay, a Xenopus embryonic thyroid essay, which is under OEC validation on the last uh, uh, year, and uh, an uh, immunohistochemistry and 3D reconstruction and behavior analysis. So to make it short, the Xenopus embryonic thyroid essay has been developed uh, more than 10 years ago. And we, um, so it was done uh, in adding a transgene that responds to thyroid hormone meaning that there are some thyroid response elements and you, when you put thyroid hormone in water, there are GFP, so green fluorescent protein, that is expressed in tissues of the tadpole. Here you have the head of tadpole in ventral view, so you don't consider the yellow fluorescence that is non-specific, uh, but the green one, which is, for example, here on the gills or on the cartilage. And the beauty of that is that when you put a compound into the water in competition with the T3, you may see an increase or a decrease as, it, as it's shown here on, on, on the picture. Uh, it was a, a flame retardant that we used. And the protocol is quite simple with uh, six well plate with 15 tadpoles per well, and uh, we renew every day. So the results, uh, we've tested the 15 compounds alone at different concentrations, and then we've tested the mixture. On the left part of the slide, you can see two of the 15 compounds, the DEHP, which is used in a medical device. It's a, a phthalate that is uh, used to soften the plastics. And what you can see here is that uh, we did see an increase of fluorescence when we add T3 into the water. This is expected. And then we uh, saw a more uh, fluorescence where, when we put uh, DEHP at one micromolar or 0.1 micromolar. Interestingly, when we've tested the perforinated uh, octane sulfonic acid, so the PFOS, but also the PFOA, we observed a non-monotonic dose responses where we had a potentialization of thyroid hormone effect uh, at the 10 to the minus 10 molar concentration and a diminution at 10 to the minus 5 molar concentration. But the most important was to test the mixture. 
And we've tested it at three concentrations. The one, 1x, one which is the, the concentration found in amniotic fluid, 10 times more and 10 times less. What we did observe was a significant increase of the fluorescence, so a potentialization of the effect of thyroid hormone uh, at 1x and 10x. And I remind you that too much is as bad as too little. So we don't know the consequences and they could be detrimental. And the last uh, thing on the, the slide is the NH3, which is an antagonist. And it's just to show that it was specific because when you put T3 plus mixture, plus this antagonist, you block the signaling and you can see that we are uh, almost at the control levels. Then we wanted to look at the um, uh, cell population in the brain. So we, uh, we studied the expression of some genes uh, in the brain, neuronal markers, oligodendrocytes markers. We saw some um, the down regulations of uh, neuronal and oligodendrocyte marker. And more importantly, uh, it was supposed to move, but uh, on the, the bottom of the slide, you can see a 3D reconstruction of a brain uh, tadpoles exposed to the, to the mixture at different concentrations. What we did do uh, is uh, to, uh, to uh, dissect the, the brains, make them transparent, and use specific antibodies for neurons and oligodendrocytes. Neurons are in red and oligodendrocytes in green. We focused on the hind brain, so on the, on the small part of the brain where the two populations were present, and we quantified both the number of cells and also volumes. What we did see was not, yeah, there was a reduction of the cell counts, but it was not significant, but what was significant and really significant was a reduction in the neuronal volume and uh, an increase in uh, the oligodendrocyte volume. And these features are fitting with what was observed in human in both the uh, Team Corivar and uh, Robin Peters study, but also uh, in um, some other studies that are looking at uh, autistic patients and the, 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 the volumes of these cells. So we wanted, because we can't really test IQ on the tadpole, but we wanted to test uh, their ability to move. And we know that the tadpoles are uh, stimulated by light, uh, conversely to the, to the zebrafishes. But so here we put one tadpole per well and we use a video tracking system, an infrared system, which is recording the movement of every tadpole for 10 minutes. And every 30 seconds you have a light on, light off switch. And we re recorded the whole 10 minutes and what we did see was a strong reduction and significant reduction of the mobility of these tadpoles at the highest concentration. So taken into a whole, so this, was, this work was done with my former PhD student, uh, Bilal Mugal, and we did observe that the mixture of chemicals is thyroid hormone disruptive, that whole allogenated compounds, this I didn't show you, but all the allogenated compounds were uh, disrupting thyroid hormone, and that the mixture affects brain gene expression, cell volume, and uh, the structure of the brain, and also the mobility. One limitation of this kind of approach is that uh, the ad adverse effect that could be seen with a reduction of mobility and perhaps escaping from the predator, um, it, and the endocrine-related mechanism that we saw with the thyroid hormone signaling modification are shown in a model and not in human. So that's one, what we started to work on with the second strategy uh, within a European project named EDC Mix Risk, where we started from epidemiological data. So to introduce you this project, there was a Selma cohort, so it's the Swedish cohort, uh, that is followed from um, the gestation. So when the, the pregnant women um, were pregnant, there were uh, some urine and plasma serum uh, that were collected. And the, 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 the children were followed from uh, birth and to adolescence now. And at 30 months old, the children were examined for uh, neuronal development and they were uh, tested for the number of words they were able to say. And uh, so some of the ch these children were uh, with a language delay and the chemists went back to the samples collected, sorry, during pregnancy 
and uh, identify the mixture that could be uh, associated with this language delay. This mixture was made of eight compounds, mainly phthalates and perifluorinated compounds, and also bisphenol A. So our work was to test the tarid hormone disruptive potential of this mixture, and also to see if it interfered with the normal brain development. We used exactly the same strategy with a three-day exposure xenoprostat pose with the fluorescent assay, gene expression, and behavior analysis. So we've tested the, the, the mixture at four concentrations, the actual one, one X that is found in uh, pregnant women fluid at the, these concentrations, 10 times, 100 times, and 1,000 times. And we did observe, and this is unfrequent, uh, that we had a strong down regulation of uh, the GFP uh, with 1X and 10X concentration. So without thyroid hormone stimulation, we were able to see a disruption. And uh, we saw also a disruption with the T3 challenge uh, <coughs> at 10X, 100X, and 1000X. This uh, illustrates that all the concentrations that we've tested could have an impact either in presence or in absence of thyroid hormone within 72 hours. So we questioned about the consequences of thyroid hormone related transcripts. And I will give you two examples. Uh, so we've collected brains of these tadpoles exposed to the mixture and did acute quantitative PCR. And we did observe a uh, significant downregulation on two important genes, uh, thyroid hormone receptor alpha, and also another membrane transporter, uh, OATP1C1. And these uh, were down, both downregulated at 10x concentration, as we did observe with the GFP pontification. And when we looked at the plus T3 part, so the challenge between the T3 and the mixture, we did observe a strong downregulation of uh, TR beta and another transcription factor of TH bzip. And again, at 1000x concentration, we had this uh, uh, correlation with the results that we obtained on the GFP and transgenic animals. So we wanted to test the behavior and we've done the same kind of thing, but there is another representation. You can see the movement of the tadpole, the control tadpole over the 10 minutes. You can see that they move more during light periods and less during dark periods and they get a bit used to the stimulus, so they move a bit less at the end of the experiment. When you compare to the tadpoles that were exposed to the mixture, you may see uh, when 1x no differences or slight differences at the end of the experiments, where you see that they don't respond the same way. Uh, it's um, even more uh, Im importantly uh, seen at the with the 10x uh, neuronal mixture, where you see that there is a uh, le uh, the amplitude is less at the beginning of the experiments. It's quite the same for the 100x, but for the 1000x, it's completely flat from two minutes onwards, where you can see that there is no response at all to the stimulus. And so, meaning that all the concentrations were also able to uh, modify the, the regulation. So, this is the work done by Michel Limens, uh, our actual um, of a PhD student, and we showed uh, with these uh, results that the mixture that was associated with neurodevelopmental delay in children disrupts the thyroid hormone signaling and affects brain gene expression and has the potential to impede behavior. So this is preprint on bioarchive. So if you want to see it, uh, there is it's a consortium paper that it's uh, still under review for the moment, but uh, there are many uh, other groups that we worked, we worked with the same mixture on other models like zebrafish or brain, uh, human brain organoids. And to yeah, open the discussion, I showed you that our chemical environment could interfere with thyroid hormone, that the chimeric mixture is impacting thyroid hormone regulation, that the mixture that is ident identified uh, uh, with the language delay is also affecting thyroid hormone signaling in vivo. And uh, I, I want to stress that the legislation of these compounds, even though we have strong uh, uh, effects, we, we cannot um, see the legislation of a mixture because for the moment, laws on a ban are only for single compounds. And also that um, an harmonized development could be 
so affect by the chemicals directly, but it could be something more uh, make vulnerable, make you susceptible to uh, disruption. So it's let's let's open that for the for the discussion. So I want to acknowledge all the people that worked on that, uh, Barbara Demenex and and all the others I already presented. Thank you very much, and I open for the question. Thank you, Dr. Feeney, very much. I think since we got started just a little bit late, we'll aim to stay on for maybe the next six or so minutes, and yeah. that way we'll have a chance to get some questions. Yes. And just a reminder to the participants, if you have a question for Dr. Feeney, you can type that into the Q&A um, button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And we do have one question already, and it follows up on your comments about legislation and regulation. Yeah. So, you used an OECD method to test the chemicals. Are you aware of regulatory responses to this research in terms of regulating chemicals that affect thyroid hormone in utero? Um, yeah, so it's an OECD uh, test guideline that is going, it's going into the validation process. So it's on the late uh, phase of validation. So I think it will be a test guideline next year or the year after, but it's not uh, already uh, been used by uh, you know, as an OECD recommended standard. And uh, what is important to, to see is, uh, and this I learned really recently, is that when you consider human health, only mammals, mammals matter. So if you have strong effects on the brain of a tadpole, as I showed you, and strong effect on thyroid and specific uh, effects on thyroid hormones, uh, it can't be uh, really taken into account when you consider uh, legislation for humans. It will be considered for, uh, for the environment. But uh, even, even though the, the model is really striking and it's really relevant, the, so these legislation are, uh, you know, we are not the, the only one that are working on that, but uh, to follow the question, to answer the question, no, there is no regulation of these compounds. We know that some of these compounds have been regulated, like for example, bisphenol A is banned in France, but um, there is, uh, for uh, some pesticides, you may see some uh, legacy pesticides that are still in, uh, in our blood, but it, when they were banned really uh, in the 70s, but they are persistent. And, uh, and uh, yes, we will continue this work on uh, a mouse model to, to be able to show that perhaps there is also something on mammals and cross placenta. So. I hope I answered the question. Yes, I think you did. Um, another question that came through, it says that they are from a highly uh, exposed PFOA community. And a lot of people are showing massive thyroid disruption in their community, especially the children. Do you yeah. know if these effects on the thyroid hormones will be lifelong? Um, no, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> You, there, there are some work that uh, try to make some yeah, correlation between the, the, the expectancy lifespan. This is the question. I'm sorry, I, perhaps I misunderstood. I, I'm thinking about lifespan and thyroid hormone disruption early, early on. This is the, the question. Because yeah, there, that. yeah, okay. There, so there are some correlations between uh, thyroid hormone levels and perhaps a long lifespan. lifespan. Uh, but it's more uh, common to see uh, low, but not uh, not too low. You know, it's on the border of the hypothyroidism. On at the end of the life, there are some yeah some thinking that it could uh, it could be a good thing to have low thyroid hormone uh, to to live longer. But um, the more important, I think, when you have uh, thyroid hormone problems at the beginning. Uh, they are the brain maturations, but also thermogenesis and uh, the problems on the heart. These are the main problems that you will encounter. Right. So I think your, your finding is that there are lifelong um, effects from these early thyroid hormone disruptions. Is that uh, accurate? We haven't studied that 
uh, in our lab, but I know that some people are looking in centenarians and levels of thyroid hormone, and they found some correlations. I can't really say that if you, you can live longer if you have uh, no thyroid problems or I, I don't know. This is something that is interesting, but I, I, I can't really answer that question. All right, I think we have time for one more question. If you were to suggest legislative or regulatory priorities, which EDCs and which EDC sources would you target and how? And also oh. what role do you think fluorine plays, if any, in disrupting thyroid function? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, fluorine um, made of, uh, so the, yeah, it's a multiple question, but I will try to answer. the. As, as you saw, and I, I just mentioned it, but halogenated compounds are, uh, so you have chlorine, brominated, and fluor. Fluorine uh, compounds are the most prone to disrupt thyroid hormone. We don't know why, perhaps it's because of the halogenated uh, uh, property of this hormone. And um, what, what is striking is that most of the chlorinated, so the PCBs are banned now, and they were replaced by brominated, but they are also persistent. So they are on the Stockholm uh, Convention and they are uh, like considered as POPs. So they, they are other uh, brominated compounds and uh, perfluorinated compounds that are used in the fried pan, as I told you. So if I had to regulate something first, that would be to uh, first um, make an obligation for a new chemical that is put on the market to be tested for these properties of thyroid hormone disruption. And second, uh, to, to try to use less allogenated compounds because uh, we know that they are the more prone to, to disrupt thyroid hormone. So I'm, I, will, I will go for perfluorinated and polybrominated compounds. But really, uh, for the phthalates, uh, you know, there are some the differences if they are short uh, chain or long chain phthalates. It's the same for parabens. And the short chain uh, are more uh, susceptible to affect your health than the long chain. And I think that for the brominated and perfluorinated, it could be the same. You have, you know, like a, a graduation, not all are bad, but they need to be tested. That's the thing. For the moment, we are putting, well, we, not we, but people that are producing uh, chemicals are putting them on the market and uh, they don't test them for their endocrine disruptive potency. And this will really change the, the thing if uh, there is uh, an obligation to test uh, these properties. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I think we're going to have to wrap up now due to time, but I wanted to extend a big thank you to Dr. Feeney today for joining us from Europe despite the internet connections and also <laughs> want to thank all of our participants. We did have some additional questions come in and we will make sure that those get shared with you. Okay, I, I can answer that. Yeah, okay. yeah I answered online. And so thank you everyone. I think I'll hand it back to you now, Maria. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording of this webinar will be available on the CHE website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. CHE's next partnership call from the CHE Alaska Partnership will take place Wednesday, November 28th, and is titled, A Holistic Approach to Public Health, Addressing Toxic Exposures, Environmental Justice, and Intergenerational Trauma. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. Jay's next webinar from the CHE EDC Strategies Partnership will take place during the week of December 10th and will feature new research on phthalates and language development. Details will be available on our website soon. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. 
With that, I would like to thank Dr. Feeney for taking the time to talk with us today and Katie for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.